Empire employees since 2013 suck, right? That's what you, that's what you meant to say? Thank you. Uh, so obviously, um, I'm Steve Silvers. Uh, I was the CEO at Empire Today uh, so, uh, for 16 years. And uh, so I actually started there. Uh, my, my background is accounting and finance. So I'm an accounting and finance guy. I'm not a sales guy. I'm not a marketing guy. Uh, though I've learned all that stuff along, along the way over many, many years of doing this type of stuff. Uh, 25 years in total, I've been in the home improvement industry. So outside of flooring, I've done painting, I've done windows, siding, roofing, solar, bath liners, um, and uh, I'm back in flooring. So after about a seven year hiatus of not being in the flooring industry, I'm back in it. Uh, and uh, you know, I bring a passion for flooring. Uh, it's always been a passion of mine. Uh, I was uh, unable to be in the flooring industry for seven years. So interesting enough, the day after my non compete ended, uh, I was uh, hired uh, by Express Flooring, uh, and uh, you know we're focusing on a similar strategy to Empire, which is to, to grow. Uh, I've been there for about a year, and it's been an amazing experience so far, and I'm uh, really super excited about where the company's headed. So another one, another thing I want to say real quick, uh, Jason touched on a lot of interesting subjects, and frankly, this is the first time Jason and I have ever seen each other face to face. Uh, I think we've had one conversation over the phone, uh, but. Um, Interesting enough, uh, you know, we didn't coordinate anything we were going to talk about, but there's a common theme in a lot of the things that we talked about. Uh, we should tell you guys something, right? These are two independent guys that help grow businesses and develop businesses, um, and you're going to hear some of the same things. And there's threads within these conversations we're going to have that are going to be very similar, uh, which tells me something. Surprising me, you know, I thought I was just coming out here to bullshit you guys. But I guess in terms of what I'm actually going to say, uh, Jason discovered some of these same things along his path to success, success as well. So to me, that's some validation there. And that should be some validation to you guys as well that maybe there is a nugget, one or two little nuggets you can pick out of this conversation, our conversations today, and take it with you and be successful with those things. So um, my uh, Empire Today story is, is, is kind of interesting. I started when I was a family-owned business. Uh, I was a $28 million small company, not small, but company in Chicago. That's the only place we operated. Uh, uh, you know, founded and led by an entrepreneur who decided uh, he started his business actually selling plastic covers for furniture. And when he was doing that, people started asking, "What well, can you do flooring? And it was all in the home. Uh, so next thing you know, he started selling flooring in the home. He wanted uh, television advertising, if anyone here is from Chicago. Uh, you know, you grew up hearing the jingle, you heard up, you grew up knowing that brand. Uh, I ended up, oh wow, who's here? Uh, that's funny. Uh, so, so, uh, I, uh, uh, so I went in there, and ultimately the owner of the company decided he wanted to sell the business. So he brought me in as the CFO, uh, and uh, history started there. We sold the private equity. We went from 28 million to about 700 million dollars. It was kind of the peak when I was there. I, I went from CFO to Senior Vice President of Operations to CEO ultimately uh, before I left. And we had tremendous success. We grew nationally to the point where we were covering, covering about 72% of the U.S. households. Um, you know, since 2013 till today, they actually haven't actually grown that much. They're a little bit bigger than they were back then, uh, but really, really not that much larger. Um, there's changed the strategies a bit, but uh, they're not much of a bigger company. Most of the growth that we achieved happened in about a 10-year 10, 10 period of time. So, you know, when I talk about some of the stuff I learned along the way, you know, 10 years, we went from $28 million in revenue with about 50 employees to $700 million in revenue, uh, peaked out at about 15, 1,500 employees. So, tremendous growth, very rapid. And in that process, I learned a ton. You know, I didn't come with a lot. But I learned a lot, uh, and, and it was it was a great experience for me. So, what did I learn along the way? So, there's there's kind of five things that I kind of bolded here that I'm going to touch on a little bit. One, um, it all starts with working um, on your business versus in your business, and we're going to touch on these a little bit more. Uh, I kind of believe never be the smartest person at the table. So, whether you're having meetings or conferences. I like to be the stupidest person at the table, which is pretty easy for me most of the time. So, but I really believe that uh, if I'm the smartest one at the table, I'm, I'm not doing something right as an entrepreneur or a leader of an organization. 
Uh, I believe in hiring strong. You know, Jason talked about hiring. Uh, I believe in measuring what matters. You know, if you're not measuring what you're doing, um, then you're, you're destined to fail. You, you gotta understand your business, and you gotta understand the metrics to drive your business. Uh, and at the end of the day, it ends with culture. And uh, actually, I, I think I learned some of that at Empire, and Brian Alinas over here also taught me a lot about uh, culture as well, and how important that was within an organization. So uh, culture is hugely important if you're gonna be successful. So, I think I did, yeah, that's fine. So let me ask you guys a question. Uh, who feels like uh, all day, every day, all you're doing is putting out fires? Raise your hand. That's what you're doing most of your, most of your time is spend putting out fires. You lie. You're all lying or you're not willing to admit to it. Because that's the reality of what goes on most of the time, right? Most of the time we're putting out fires. Which reminds me how difficult that is, right? If you're putting out fires every single day, you're not working on your business. So here's a little video. Here's my great grandfather. He's the first cat herder in our family. Herding cats. Don't let anybody tell you it's easy. Anybody can herd cattle. Holding together 10,000 half wild short hairs, or that's another thing altogether. Being a cat herder is probably about the toughest thing I think I've ever done. I got this one this morning, right here. And if you look at his face, it's it just ripped to shreds. Nope. You see the movies, yeah. you hear the stories, it's. I'm living a dream. Not everyone can do what we do. I wouldn't do nothing else. It ain't an easy job, but when you bring a herd into town and you ain't lost to one of them, I ain't feeling like in the world. All right. So if all you're doing all day long is putting out fires or hurting cats, you're really not working on your business. You're not growing your business. You're continuously just distracted. And it's really, you know, if, if, if any lesson came out of anything I did at Empire, was to transform the way I, I managed the business from someone who was herding cats all day to someone who was working on developing and growing my business. And it's really simple. It's very comfortable sometimes to get back to sitting down at a desk and working on a spreadsheet or to paying your bills, things you shouldn't be doing, paying your bills, um, collecting money, um, you know, answering phone calls, dealing with customer service issues that somebody else can deal with, um, dealing with conflict. You know, you could be spending all your time doing that stuff all day long, which a lot of people do. But if you really want to grow your business, you want to be successful, and, and I even heard it as Jason was talking, you get the vibe from him. You know, he's working on his business all the time. And that's really the game changer. We were at about 100, 150 million dollars, and, and we've grown tremendously, uh, and I was still the CFO of the organization, and I was pulling out my gear. I was, I was doing the financials, doing budgeting, reading leases, doing all kinds of operational stuff. And I was, I mean, I got to the point where I was, I was like literally ready to check myself into an institution. And I had a conversation with one of my mentors. If you don't have a mentor, you should have one. I had a conversation with a mentor and he said, what, what are you doing yourself? You know, you're, you're backed by private equity. You're gonna grow this company from what was 28 million to, you know, hopefully a billion one day. And you're doing all this stuff and you, you can't. You, you can't be focused on these day-to-day task stuff that you can delegate to someone who else can be doing it and use your mind to think about how you're going to grow this company and what are the strategies you need to implement. And it was a game changer for me. It was the next day I put it out in the paper, back then it was papers, uh, for a CFO, you know, I started, I hired tax people, um, I brought in a vice president of operations, I hired a real estate person, um, and my life changed. So I became someone who was doing all these things to building a team who did all that stuff for me, and then I managed that team, and I developed a strategy for the organization going forward, and that kind of stuff. And that, that, that was it. That was the major change, the button that got turned, that changed everything for me, and ultimately helped accelerate the growth of Empire so that we achieved what we did in such a short period of time. So you gotta make sure you are finding time and building time in your day to make sure that you can focus on driving your business versus working in your business. Um, and it takes getting the right bus in the right seats uh, on the bus. And if you don't have the right people, you're never going to get there. So um, when we talk about uh, being the smartest person at the table, I'm a huge believer in that. Okay. I, again, I, I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. I don't want to be the smartest person at the table. 
There are many more people, much more talented than I. My job is to bring them together, make them work for me, and help them figure out, clear the path so they can help me grow my business. So, more video. Where are you from? We are from Switzerland. <laughs> Okay, you know what, we're gonna focus on business. Right? Switzerland, I love Switzerland. It is one of my favorite countries. I love your army knives, with the toothpicks, and your cheese. Does the cheese come out of the cow with the holes? Our countries are not enemies, they are friends. We are friends. You have been to Switzerland? No, but I have a friend who drives a Volvo. And I speak a little of your language. Heard of he said do. Heard of who to who to be. Alright. So, that's me. That's who I want to be. I want to be Steve Carell at every single meeting I go to, where I'm surrounded by much smarter people than me and helping me figure out how I'm going to take the company from point A to point B. That's, that's what I achieve and my goal is to achieve every single day. And that means finding the right people, right? You gotta be able to find the right resources out there to help you achieve that, and you gotta allow yourself. I mean, as entrepreneurs, we all come to the table with fairly a big ego. You know, uh, you know I, I met lots of entrepreneurs, big egos, um, and it's just part of it, you know, including myself. But you have to know how to, and when to check that ego to allow other people to go ahead and help you grow your business. Bring the specialty to it, bring the answers to you. That's the key to the entire experience. If you want to grow your business, surround yourself with people smarter than you. So Jason did a great job. He talked a little bit about our most important asset, right? Our most important assets as business owners is our people. We know that. That is absolutely it. If you're going to succeed, if that's my mom, tell her I'm in the middle of something. Um, if it's my wife, tell her I'm not. So. Uh, <laughs> Anyhow, so obviously the people, people is the most important asset you have. That is, if you're gonna live and die by your people, that's a common theme and a thread between what I'm saying and even what Jason said earlier. So hiring and firing, there is nothing more important than that. And I put firing in that with hiring, because to me it's one and the same. You know, we're, none of us are great at hiring. 100% of the time we don't hire great people. So you gotta, you know, Hire slow, you've heard this before, we're gonna talk about hire slow, fire fast. So let's talk about hiring as much as clip. I'm a bit of a smart plug and a human resources lady. Oh, oh no, it, it's actually, it's Pam. I'm oh, sorry. Well, Pam. No, my name is Pam. Are you saying Pam or Pam? I'm saying Pam. Yeah, I'm sorry, who's this gentleman sitting behind you? Hello, my lady. I'm Brett. I'm Brett's stepbrother, and I think I might be able to help with a Pam Pam dilemma. Yeah, that'd be great. Pam. 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 With an N. There's no D. It's Pam. It's like Tom. It's P. P A N M. 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 No, there's just one N. All right. So, whoever sat through an interview like that. I feel like I have, right? I feel like I've sat through an interview and, and, and I sit there and five, five minutes later I'm like, how did this person even get to my office? That, that happens every once in a while, right? But the reality is hiring is so important. And if you're not investing into your hiring process and, and you're not smart about who you hire, you're making a, you're making a huge injustice to yourself. And it's going to stunt your ability to grow and to build the business you want to grow. I'm a huge believer in hire slow. I take my time. I go very slow. You know, I want to make sure I have the right candidate. I do lots of group interviews. It's not just me, but I'll get four or five members of my team to interview people as well. Because um, I really want to go ahead and make sure and vet these people to make sure that they have the skill sets that I'm looking for, but also the emotional intelligence that, that I'm looking for. Someone who can fit into the culture, can speak, can listen, take direction, has the right energy, has someone I can help build passion with. So finding that person who has that emotional intelligence and that skill set, you know, I don't care if it takes uh, four months. I'm going to take my time to make sure I hire the right person. On the reverse, when I make a bad hire and it happens, I know I need to fire them quickly. You have to move fast because every single day you don't, it sets you back a day from your ability to grow your business. It's costs you money. It's 
creating gray here, it's causing me to lose here. All this is because of the people I didn't fire fast enough. This whole look is because I didn't fire people fast enough. Uh, that's the reality. So you gotta be committed to it, and it is really, at the end of the day, there's really nothing more important. And if you really spend some time thinking about the people working for you, um, you know what I'm saying is I'm just, I'm telling the truth. You gotta get rid of people. Uh, the other thing is don't make excuses. You know, there's lots of us who've had employees that worked with us for 15, 20, 25 years and we're loyal to them. We love them. You know, they've been there for a long time and they helped me grow my business to where it is. But are they the right person to take me to the next level? You know, you can talk yourself into an employee that's been with you all day long for as long as you want. But the reality is there are limitations. As great of managers as we are and motivators as we are, some people you can just take to a certain point. And if you can't take them any further, sometimes it's not you, it's them. And if that's the case, you're doing, again, you're doing yourself an injustice. You know, we all are loyal to people. We all expect people to be loyal back to us. But again, you guys are business owners, you're entrepreneurs, you're trying to grow something and develop something. And you can't let people hold you back. And you certainly can't let people that, you know, they can take you from A to B, but they can't get you to C or D. And if that's the case, sometimes you have to have very tough conversations. And like I like to say is, I, sometimes I just have to promote people to customers. That's what I do. I turn them into a customer. They can have a lifelong friends and family discount. That's okay, but we're just kind of moving on from you. So, measure what matters. So, there was no funny videos around key performance indicators. So there's nothing funny, no video for KPI. But it is, it is important, right? Um, Jason also he mentions, uh, uh, message, mentioned ooh, a book called Traction, which is a phenomenal book. And if you haven't read it, you should read it. I know there's another, another guy is in, in this building too who's a super successful entrepreneur that also I know has read the book and he's using it in his business that he's developing right now day to day. It's a great book, I didn't mention it here. If you haven't read it, go buy it. It's really short, but it really puts everything into perspective on what you, think you should be thinking and doing every single day. But a book that I, that I also love is called Measure What Matters. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, again, account finance guy, so metrics is kind of how I live my life. Um, and it's all about understanding how to measure your business, right? And there's, there's two different ways, there's, there's two different indicators when it comes to measuring your business, right? There's, Leading indicators and lagging indicators. Does anyone know the difference between a leading indicator and a lagging indicator? Well, I'm going to tell you, so you're lucky. Um, you came to the right place. So, listen, the reality is, you know, our business, there's so many different metrics we can measure, right? And there's things that drive business, and there's things that after the fact you measure how you did. But you need to be looking out your front windshield all the time which means what's in front of you, what are you gonna to do to drive your business forward? So a leading indicator could be, um, how many customers came into my showroom today? Or this week, or this month? Are you measuring how many customers are coming in? Are you measuring your marketing spend? Uh, if, I, if I go ahead and I do a, um, I don't know, a money mail or any kind of mailing or postcards, are you putting a phone number on there to actually track those results? So you actually know how many people are calling you or how many people are bringing bring those coupons back in or show me inquiry. That's leading indicator. Right? That's very upfront stuff. It's top of the funnel. It's at the very beginning of the process. That's, that's really the most important metrics you need to be measuring. Because the lagging stuff is the backside. Do I have revenue? Did I sell stuff? Well, I didn't sell stuff unless I actually know that I generated generated leads on the front, right? People coming into the store. If I didn't do that, that leading stuff, then of course I'm not gonna have lagging stuff. But you need, to be, you need to be defining what your leading indicators are. Are you buying your material at the right price? You know, are you being competitive with your vendors and making sure that they're giving you the best price possible? That's a leading indicator. Because at the end of the day, it's gonna impact your margins. That's a lagging indicator. Your profit margins are after the fact already. So there's a big difference between leading and lagging. We all generally spend too much time thinking about lagging indicators. We look at our financial statements, what was our revenue, what was our margins, um, what was my cost, uh, what's my overhead cost, but we don't spend enough me looking at the leading, the, the leading indicators. How many orders did this person process today? Okay, that affects my overhead at the end of the day. 
do I have two or three people doing the same thing and one of them does it really well and does 50 of these things and the other two do 20 of these things? Well, why can't the other two doing 20 do 50? You know, I need those other two combined into one person that's doing 40 and a 50 and I save my overhead cost. But if I don't measure that stuff in the front, I have no idea how to relate that to the stuff in the back, which is ultimately your financial results and your profit and the money you're putting in your pocket. So you gotta make sure you're understanding there is a difference between a leading indicator and a lagging indicator. And use that stuff to make decisions. Perfect example is I just gave. I got two people doing 20. I'm gonna get rid of one of them. I'm gonna save the cost. I'm gonna have another one person that I'm gonna train and hire them to do 40, or take one of those and have them do 40. I'm gonna spend that payroll on marketing so I can drive more revenue. So leading, lagging indicators, understand it. This is a great book that talks about measuring what matters and understanding how to set goals, how to actually put metrics around goals, measure those goals, a limited number of items. Uh, it's a really, it's really an interesting book. Um, so I, I, you know, if you're into this kind of stuff, I highly recommend you get it. So culture, again, yeah, Jason touched on culture. You know, at the end of the day, it all, it all ends with culture. So if you don't establish a great culture, if you don't spend time building a culture within your organization, um, you're going to fail. You know, or you're going to you're going to get gray and bald, and you're going to you're working your ass off, and you're not going to see a lot of progress. Because culture is what drives everybody else in your organization. If you have a good culture, they want to come to work, they want to come and take care of your associates. Uh, you know, they want to work for you. Culture is so important um, from from a growth perspective. When we asked Reebok to send us Terry Tank, some people thought we were crazy. But I'm a firm believer in paradigm breaking, outside the box thinking. Hey, buddy. <laughs> it was over 15 minutes ago, Mitch! And since Terry's been with us, our productivity has gone up 46%. <laughs> We're getting more from our employees than ever before. You know you need a cover sheet on your TPS reports, Richard! That ain't your baby! Hey, Janice! <laughs> but what's really impressive is how Terry's become part of the Felcher family. <laughs> he fits right in here. To be honest, I wish Reebok sent us 10 Terry Tanks. Alright, so I love Terry Tate, and if I could hire him, I would. Uh, yeah, obviously, get shit done, but, but the reality is, who wants that kind of culture, right? Of constant threats and abuse and to tackle, getting tackled, and all that kind of stuff. But most employees don't appreciate that kind of behavior. But the reality is, if you create a great culture, that is the underlying pinnacle of everything I've talked about so far, right? It all relates back to building a culture and understanding what your expectations are. Um, it is, it's, it's, at the end of the day, it is all about culture. And it expressed, you know, um, we're working on a cultural shift there. And, you know, I kind of set my expectations, the way I do a culture to some extent is setting expectations. What is it I expect my employees to do every single day? Um, and I build a culture around that. And in Express, uh, we, we've kind of settled on our culture is going to be uh, settled around problem solvers. That's what we are in Express. We are all problem solvers. And all of our employees, uh, all of our salespeople, all of our installers, we're all focused on one thing, is we solve problems. That's our job. Our job description every single day is just to solve problems. To go out there and, uh, whether it's a consumer, or a problem for an installer, or a problem for a sales rep, it's all the same thing. Our job, and my job, every single day is just to solve problems. It's just at different levels within the organization. But if you're doing that, and your culture is, is, is and I believe if your culture is based on that concept, we're problem solvers, well, that leads to a lot of great stuff, right? Great reputation online, uh, a lot more leads, a lot more sales, um, a fun place to work, which is a novelty, right? You know, would that be great to have a fun place to go to work every single day? And uh, that's something we're driving with our installers. We want our installers to know they can come work for us and we're gonna have a great culture and environment for them. We want them to come to work and have fun, um, which for installers is not so easy, right? So um, that's the idea. Culture, if you're not spending time working on your business, 
versus just in your business. You're not thinking about your culture. You gotta be working on your business and thinking about the kind of culture you wanna drive because you won't grow without the right culture. And even at Empire, um, which you know, our culture shifted and changed a lot over the years I was there, um, it, we were only successful because we hired talented people that were smart, we had a good culture that allowed them to go out and, and make decisions, we empowered them, and they were successful. So, last slide for me. Um, you know, I, I come to these kinds of things all the time, right? I listen to what other entrepreneurs have to say, I read books, I do all these kinds of things. There's one common thing that I, I've learned from all these experiences, which is, um, first of all, I really have very little control over anything. I don't have any control over my life, my, my kids, uh, my family, uh, at work. I don't have a lot of control. I think I've got a lot of control, but if you talk to anybody else in my life, they just kind of laugh at you and say, you know, you're an idiot. You don't have any control. Just go over, especially my kids. My kids want to, you know, they're, they think I'm a moron. So, and they're probably right, but, but the reality is we have very little control. But the one thing we do have control over is the start. And what does that mean? You can decide right now, I'm gonna take a few of the things I learned today, and I'm gonna go do it. Because if you never start, you'll never get anywhere. So the only real thing I think that you really can control in your life is the beginning. It's the decision to go and start. Once you start, other things get in the way, other things will start to, they'll start to morph, they'll start to go on their own. But if you guys, as leaders, entrepreneurs, business owners, if you start it, it'll keep going. So that's, you know, that's my, my advice to you, and I don't, you know, I'm hardly the right guy to be taking advice from, to be honest with you, but the reality is, um, if you just start, just start, the rest of it takes care of itself, believe it or not. It really does. So, thank you guys. Any questions? Perfect. Wait for the mic, please. Was I the guy? I don't know, I don't want to answer that question. Did you hire the guy that came up with the idea of install one room and get the next room, find one room, get one free? Yeah, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I'm scared to throw something at you. Uh, but, uh, but that's cushion, right? So that's good, all right, so give it back to me. Uh, it was a collective idea, you know? And, you know, it was a collective. Everything, everything I do, I don't take credit for anything. Everything I do is it's collective, it's a group of people sitting around a table talking about ideas and thoughts and strategies and let the best ideas win. Uh, so collectively as a group, yes, we came up with that idea. And you know, whether you guys like it or not as retailers, uh, I'll tell you from an empire perspective, it was a huge win. We, we gobbled up a tremendous amount of market share from um, some of the people even in this room from some of those concepts that you look at, you might look at and say, that's the stupidest thing ever. But, uh, it, you know, I can't argue with what works. And I'm not sure that's where you're going with that question, but just in case. Any other questions? I'm not interested. We're over here. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering, the advice always comes across as always be hiring, always be interviewing. I don't have room for any more people in my showroom, and I have people applying, and some of them are good. Well, when you say that, yeah, I mean, the reality is, you got there's always something better. There is always something better. I guarantee you, I don't know how many employees you have or how many salespeople you have, but you gotta, you know, stack rate them. You know, again, it's, it gets back to the understanding of metrics and, and close rates and those kinds of things. But you gotta rank them, and every, it's, I always look at a sales organization like a baseball team, and I'm probably, I, there's probably many other people that do it the exact same way as I do, right? But you got your one, your two, and your third hitter that is knocking out of the park, your fourth hitter that's hitting home runs, you got great salespeople. No matter what your sales organization is, I hear, there isn't one, it's impossible, not one sales organization in any organization across the world, every single person is the best person. But we want the best person. We want more of the best person. So you got to rank them, and then there's always there's always room to get rid of number eight or nine. The reality is eight or nine, no matter how much you work with them, you're never going to make them better. Almost never. I mean, I've, we've done I've done lots of analytics around these things, statistical analysis, 
And if the, uh, the chances of you taking a really bad performer on the sales side and making them great will never, never happen. You can take some in the middle and sometimes get them up, but if they're, if they're on the bottom of your sale, your best solution is just to get rid of them and find somebody better. You will never get them to be an A player. You might, it's like one out of a thousand, okay? And something dramatic happened in their life that caused it that you didn't even cause. So, thank you. How important is software to measure and close in the house? You know, being like a um, how important is it? Well, we, you know, so when I first started Empire, there was no technology. Good question. I didn't hear. How important is software to closing in a house? You know, what the impact is. So and when I started, there was none, right? Everything was paper contracts. Uh, and even at Express, we just recently went from paper to electronic. So, you know, we're paperless there now, too. Uh, it matters, you know, because it creates credibility with the customer, for one thing. And it, it depends on how much you know about shop at home versus you know, uh, brick and mortar and sales process is, is different and, and that kind of stuff, um, depending on your business model. But uh, it is important because people nowadays are used to technology. They want to see technology. And if you, if you show up at their house and you're using technology, you build credibility with the customer. Uh, and credibility helps make sales, right? At the end of the day, uh, they got you know, to know you, like you, and trust you. Um, and if they don't have those things, if you haven't been able to build those items with people, you're going to have a hard time. So it's, it's important, but it's not the end all be all. Personality is just as important. What measure software do you choose? Um, what measure software do we choose? Well, at Empire, we built our own. And uh, at Express, we're using Measure Squared with, with Rollmaster. Who does your website? Floor <laughs> <laughs> does my website. <laughs> Any other questions, guys? Anybody? And I'm I'm here. I'll be here. I'll you know don't forget this to be here. Yes. Um, one, you made me laugh today. And two, the most important thing that I've heard all day is that you said it's important to have a start. And without a start, there's nothing. Good. Thank you. I appreciate it. For lunch. <laughs> so you Check left that flooring, <laughs> and for seven years you did something else, and you came back to flooring. So I'm just curious what you did in those seven years that said. said <laughs> what did I do? I moved to California, and I didn't work, uh, so I enjoyed some time. I started a painting business, uh, and that was uh, that's a whole other shit show I could talk about for hours. Uh, uh, and then I, I got into the home improvement business, so I did window siding and roofing, um, and, and now I'm back into flooring. So uh, and along the way, did other kind of consulting things. I, I'm, uh, again, I'm a CFO by background, so I've done some of that work along the way as well, and some recruiting stuff for CFOs, so I've, I've diddled and dabbled in different kinds of things, and I got, somehow I got sucked back into flooring. You know, as they say, once it's in your blood, it's hard to get out. Uh, that's what really happened. It's happened to me. Though I will, I, well, I'm going to finish this with one last comment, and then we're going to go. One thing to know about me: I'm not a foreign person. I'm back in the industry, but I'm a, I'm a business guy. You guys, I'm telling you, every single one of you know more about foreign and European key than I know in my entire head, and I've been doing it for in combined whatever 17 years now. Uh, I don't know anything. You know, that's carpet. I know that. These are kind of pretty colors. Uh, I, like, I like color. Um, that's kind of cool. It looks like marble, but I guess it's not. I don't, I don't know anything about flooring, and I purposely don't care to. I, I try to stay away from it because building and growing a business is what I'm about. That's what that's what I enjoy doing, and I'm not going to build and grow a business because I, because of products. I don't care what product it is. It makes no difference to me. Um, so. Cool. Well, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it.